I think we need to start. I will invite you to have a seat. I will formally the session on research for biotechnology innovation. I'm going to ask Agostino Accardo to connect and I'm going to ask Francesco Menegoni <coughs> to be the co-chair of this round table. Have a fruitful session. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Good morning, thank you for the invitation for this conference, especially to, for this session. I would like to welcome those who are present physically and remotely online. I'm sorry for my online due to PhD exams and lessons in the afternoon, so my available time is quite limited. Mr. Menegoni and from Bioevali maybe wants to say something before we start this meeting. We can't hear you. I will be very brief because we are quite late. So I'm going to be very careful with my timing and I'm going to ask all the other speakers to stay within the 10 minutes that were allocated. Um, we're going to start with Fabio Bianco uh, as, the, as he can't stay around for uh, later. So, Professor Cardo, you have the floor. In this session, we want to have a meeting point, an exchange point from uh, innovation in biomedics and for companies and universities, especially University of Trieste, in order to create synergies and common research projects between companies and universities. Well, from what we heard at the previous session for the health and well-being of citizens. What is the role of universities? I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Can you see it? Yes? Very well. The role of the university is fundamentally that of connecting training and research at university level with the innovation needs from companies. In Trieste, the training on biomedics takes place in the uh, degree course in clinical engineering and bi biomedics, which are, has some specializations. There is a committee for the specializations that works with companies and welcomes companies as it is open to all. A discussion moment for the modifications for the training sessions. For example, this year we innovated from the training point of view a course to train good biomedical engineer on the prosthetics sector, especially those created in NEMA. We, are, we have some subjects, some cross-cutting areas, uh, which are worthwhile for many industries as it was required in the past. From a COVID connected topic, I can show you and you can watch and see and re-watch re the interviews 
from researchers at the level of in um, university as a group of bioengineering, we talked about aerosol and other to connected topics. From the point of view of research in this moment, we are taking forward some research projects. Um, Interact has closed and with a new call, we're going to have maybe new ones. And we are working on a pro-phase project with on the safety of patients at home with uh, Televita and Telegema. And another project started on the 1st of November. I'm going to show you just a couple of images. This is the Cassia one, Cloud Assistant for Health and Safety, with a certain a system of telemedicines. We try to follow up the, the patient at home in a non-invasive way for um, problems such as whether the person falls down or similar issues, which are then sent it to an AI system that can identify anomalies in the behavior of the elderly person. Before the European project, it, this is our last project dealing with the recoup therapies for the elderly and trying to regain movement thanks to sensors that can transmit remotely and can help the physician in its treatment in his treatment. The last slide so that I can offer some time and space because the time is quite short. The role to support companies what are the sectors where we are prepared and we can offer support starting today? The IoT devices, home assistant devices, innovative systems for diagnosis in precision medicine based on AI, like data analysis, and these are quite easy in the medical field. With this, I conclude my brief presentation, and if my co-chair agrees, I would give the floor to Mr. Fabio Bianco. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you for the invitation and your flexibility in changing the order of speakers. It will allow me to tell you what we do in bio dreams Can you see my screen? Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Fabio Bianco, I'm a Chief Scientific Officer for bio for dreams which is an incubator for startups in life sciences that deals with supporting companies at the initial stages where in an ecosystem of research at universities and it's structured to become a company. In this field, we offer services, specialized services, and investing in projects that we find to be interesting. We are operational site investor that finances, but also offers capacity for these projects. These are a couple of our figures. We have, uh, we, we are present in Italy, East Europe, we are present in various countries, Hungary, Slovenia, Finland, and we believe that uh, Trieste is a reference point because it allows us to have a dialogue with all these ecosystems. The services and activities that are provided are divided into three categories, lab, strategy and market and lastly support for management and when we invest we do so in projects where we can have an operational and structural role in order to have an entrepreneurship 
So we support the project, its development together with the team. We create the industrial and financial partnership so that the project can then proceed. We are very present at national level and we are called to support the development of the ecosystem with public and private actors. As you know, we are the main entity in the group of enterprises that uh, manages the urban center here in Trieste. We work in Milano, Milan in the Milan Innovation Mind to manage labs, shared labs for innovative startups. As you can see, we expand towards Eastern Europe, but also ecosystems such as the United States and China. We, are, we have headquarters in Philadelphia and Shanghai, so as to offer projects and a possibility to develop at financial level and arrive quickly on the market. After this brief introduction on who we are and what we do, I'm going to tell you in depth about a project that was, bought, uh, was set up in our ecosystem, Brain DTEC, which creates biomarkers in liquid such as blood, tears, and so on. The problem of neuro Neurological diseases, diseases is a huge one with great costs for the health system, costs that will increase with the aging of the population. We have 400 brain diseases with some common or common, common aspects or common problems. They need early diagnosis, it has to be precise, it needs biomarkers that need to classify patients in Alzheimer, for example, where there are various sub-diseases, markers to quantify the effectiveness of some treatments, and new drug targets to develop strategies. Brain D-Tech handles the interaction between the microglia from the central nervous system and the brain cell, which suffers from degeneration. Spe specifically, Brain Detect discovered that the cells, when activated, they create small pieces of a cell that detach from the surface and they contain microRNA, small non codifying microRNA, which change according to the disease. So according to the illness we are talking about, the content of the microRNA is different. By isolating these little spots from the blood, we can read information from inside and classify the patients in a different way. Brain Detect can do so because it developed a unique technology called MicroCatch, which is also forceps that, that can isolate the micro part from various liquid biopsies. We work with the microglia here and study the content. Through the years, the company has characterized the cell mechanism that are at the basis of these small pieces of cell, verifying the use and the importance of this mechanism on, in various diseases and with proof of concept for clinical trials from biobanks, samples, frozen samples that can be studied for different privates. You see, for example, the same four biomarkers, the black, green, yellow, and orange with Alzheimer and other forms of dementia. And you see that oftentimes the expression of these markers is different. Why do we do in brain detect? We deal with the topic of early diagnosis, but also developing new drugs in various stages and indications. 
Each indication has different problems and questions. The two questions that we try to answer is firstly, is it worthwhile to look at microRNA in this micro cells in this uh, spe specific disease? And if yes, how are we going to have an impact or cha change the patient journey, the diagnosis that the patient must go through? This is the basis of the studies that we are carrying on uh, migraine, on Alzheimer, together with consortiums who, uh, which are specialized in these illnesses. I'm going to mention a 1B type of study that the company we are carrying out with Welcome Nima Consortium with, for, for cognitive impairment and another one with the main pharma companies that deal with dementia where we are partners and we are using our technology to characterize and differentiate the patients to then create clinical trials which are specific. This is our development through the years. We were set up in 2016 with two patents we then developed in 2019-2020 with international agreements inter participating in consortium. Now we are in a consolidation phase where we are certifying and moving towards the industries, vesicles, and we have an increase in capital. And in the future, we want to be a point of reference to study diagnosis in various diseases in the central nervous system. Two words on the team. We have an innovative start, start, start up, but with a great team, both from the point of view of uh, scientific, regulatory, and industrial competences. Uh, for example, Mr. Diakono, entered recently in this team from a very important Korean, Johnson & Johnson, but also a mix uh, in the board of directors with different experiences in the biotech pharma sector. With two success stories, Gentium, which was taken to NASDAQ and bought by pharmaceuticals, and another one which was co um, uh, purchased by Novart. This is an example of a company that was set up within a research project, which then became an innovative startup that deals with a very delicate topic, especially now, that of support for the development and diagnostic for neuro, uh, 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 impairment. And it's thinking about how to use the technologies for new approaches connected to new illnesses with, for the post-COVID era. The neurological effects, for example, that unfortunately are present in many patients that, were, um, that had COVID. These are the company points of reference. Thank you for your attention. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to give the floor to Mrs. Filigoy from Vio, Vivo Biocell. Good morning. I hope you can hear me very well. Viva Biocell, it's a company set up as a spin-off from the University of Udine. This happened many years ago. In 2015, it was acquired by an American group, which is called Immunity Bio. Uh, what we do is automated bioreactors bio for the sterile production in closed system of uh, cell therapies for regenerative medicine and immunotherapies. It's part of our strategy to use uh, uh, existing programs to support uh, the companies of our region, not so much 
to to uh, receive a financing. We are uh, there are over thirty people in our companies, but to create institutional forms of collaboration that might be compared to small clusters or small systems. So we, as a company, collaborate with the academia, with research centers, with local health agencies, and with other companies, in particular companies uh, belonging to the bio-high-tech uh, uh, cluster. And we were um, one of the founders of the bio-high-tech network. I'd like to mention three projects, and uh, in particular, I'll enter into greater details of one, um, especially with reference to uh, uh, this cluster that we have set up, uh, which is cross-border in nature. I mean, the first program stands for Advanced Regenerative Ecosystem. It was a... a an interreg project involving uh, regional companies, but also hospitals from Slovenia, as well as the health agency of the central uh, of the central of Central Fiume Venezia Giulia. We experimented on humans a regenerative treatment using mesenchymal cells, uh, lipid derived mesenchymal cells. Another important project which is still ongoing, it's immunocluster. So the key words are ecosystem and immunocluster. The immunocluster deals with the development of a cell therapy for a triple negative breast cancer treatment based on an already tested, clinically tested protocol by a Slovene company, which is called Celica Biomed, for prostate cancer, re relapsing prostate cancer. And uh, the project, I wanted to talk to you more in detail, uh, is Prefer. Prefer is re a regenerative medicine project for difficult wounds, and it is an example of collaboration taking place in two directions, locally with the involvement of ICGB and the University of Trieste, but also the uh, health agency of the area. And then Zeta Research, which is a clinical research organization in Trieste, and Viva Biocell, which is a company located in Udine. The goal is that of developing a treatment for diabetic foot ulcers. This is a disease with a very high prevalence, globally 6.2%. So it's rather widespread condition. And the instruments that are currently available are indeed limited in number. Mainly, we used a extracellular matrices, uh, just like uh, band-aids uh, placed on the ulcers, thereby allowing for local regeneration of the tissues. That's the idea. We then added autologous cells to accelerate the healing of the wound to improve revascularization of the ulcer, thereby creating new uh, blood vessels uh, on uh, the extracellular matrix and in the surrounding tissues. But this was a, a remarkable achievement. We've developed a protocol together with ICGAB and with the University of Trieste and with the uh, local health agency, in particular the dermatology department of the Hospital of Trieste. And on a mouse uh, model, we were able to demonstrate the effectiveness and the safety of a therapy using the very same extracellular matrices that are available on the market, on which, however, we deposit expanded cells uh, 
thanks to our uh, equipment. And uh, what have we achieved? Well, we have uh, preclinically demonstrating the effectiveness of this therapy, and I think that the next step on humans is very close. The therapy is effective. We have demonstrated that we can reduce costs and improve the scalability of this drug, which otherwise is uh, hand-manufactured uh, uh, and we scale, allow for a scale-up thanks to the use of automated bioreactors. Uh, bio and we are about to publish a paper on a very prestigious cardiology um, magazine. The end point is to be ready for stage two, in other words, experimenting on humans, and we hope to be ready very soon. This is uh, uh, how the therapy works. We start uh, from uh, the wound. We use autologous cells, cells of the patient, a heterogeneous population of cells. They are expanded in our machine. Then they are applied on the extracellular matrix and you observe uh, the formation of new dermis and the neovascularization of surrounding tissues. This is our machine. It's a very uh, small machine that allows for the automated manufacturing of, uh, uh, of our um, extracellular matrices. Usually these uh, activities are performed by hand in very expensive sterile rooms and the manufacturing of these medications is limited and the costs are very high. Now instead we have this automated bioreactor. We manufacture these bioreactor. Um, after these extraordinary achievements, uh, the next step is that of um, starting clinical research. And here we have an advantage that lies in uh, having uh, a medication agency in Slovenia that has an easier approach to drug authorization, especially for uh, in-hospital exemption. In other words, the new drug is being used under the responsibility of the physician. We can therefore test the effectiveness and safety of therapy in, in, uh, uh, in a faster way by resorting to this collaboration with Slovenian hospitals. We have already started collaborated with the world manufacturers of extracellular matrices in Switzerland, France, and the US. And we are about to conclude uh, the uh, phase one, two clinical study for the EMA approval. And over and above Slovenia, we have started collaborating with Sweden and other countries, especially with centers dealing with regenerative medicine, and that are showing to be very interested in this uh, uh, therapy. And then, of course, uh, our boss in the US, they are a public company uh, listed on NASDAQ, and they are very interested in launching an IND uh, study. In other words, an investigation on new drug application to study that very same protocol and to use the very same faster authorization procedure uh, set in place by the FDA. Uh, FDA uh, is, is uh, much quicker than uh, EMA in Europe, which is very fragmented. And once the FDA, once we have the authorization by the FDA, it's, we can have access to a wider market. Which are the advantages of such a project? Well, first of all, the key aspect is that of locally involving, locally involving stakeholders with clinical competence, and it is much easier at local level. In other words, we can collaborate with the academia, 
with the uh, local health agencies in Udine and Trieste, with the Oncological Center in Aviano. And this is for us of great relevance because as a manufacturer of medical devices, we have to demonstrate that these equipment, that these machineries have a clinical added value. And another important aspect is to collaborate with research institutions. So this collaboration with ICGB plays a major role because even ICGB is an international organization. And therefore, we can think about uh, further valorizing our, uh, our uh, machine at global level. We think that we can produce uh, IP revenues uh, for re the research partners. We can accelerate uh, the growth of the SMEs taking part in the project, therefore Viva BioCell and Zeta Research. And we think also the revenues might derive for the academia that are our partners, because now we have a clinical study phase one and two uh, that I think will uh, produce in interesting income for the hospi hospitals involved. And also we might receive payments from payers and it could be private payers in a first, uh, in first uh, instance. And I'd like to conclude my presentation Launching an appeal, join us, join our international partnership, a partnership that was born in a very small area, but that has a wide geographic uh, scope. Thank you. I know, I hope that the University of Trieste would be very happy to know about this initiative as well. Thank you. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Spezzotti from Halifax. Good morning. I, my thanks to the organizers of uh, this meeting. We've taken part in this meeting since its first edition. So my thanks to Diego. And a special welcome to Professor Accardo, chairman of this session. We collaborate with him, so I'm very happy to be here with him today. Uh, it's like being among friends. Today I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and how COVID-19 changed our company and our growth as a company. Just to give you an idea, this is the profile of our company. We have a consolidated turnover uh, in 2020 of 62 million euros, 200 employees, foreign export market, 124 countries. We have uh, five subsidiaries in the world, China, Russia, Brazil, Spain, and Germany. And this organization, because we have two souls in our company, one uh, is very much focused on trading with major investments in uh, distribution network, while the other uh, soul has a major interest for research and innovation. Now, this organization, which in the past, uh, which is the result of our past efforts, allowed us to allowed us to ride the pandemic because for our companies COVID was a unique opportunity and we were able to uh, to benefit from it not just in Italy but also in the on these other markets which has led to an increase in our turnover by 30 million euros last year 
this is uh, the first soul. As for the second soul, that is to be found in a 30 patents uh, deposited all over the world and 10 of them were deposited in 2020. Uh, this is the employment trend. There is an increase by around 47% percent in the number of our employees. In particular, the two Friulian uh, companies with research and development in Nimes uh, and an R&D company in Area Science Park, while the regional number of employees has increased by 63%. Our latest effort um, focused on Trieste, where we have this R&D company uh, with 14 researchers right now in researchers, biotechnologists and, and uh, very specialized uh, scientists. As for the ecosystem, Alifax, thanks to the existence of our own network, and to the fact that we have uh, been able to set up uh, various networking activities, well, we have exploited the European uh, Fund for Regional Development instruments to further strengthen existing collaboration with research institutions in the area. So we have uh, basically uh, two projects within the, the European Development Front, uh, one point of care and new technologies for bacteriological uh, studies, and then the site ship industrialization. As you see, the funding received uh, uh, from Europe uh, is not that huge, uh, but that funding was an engine that drove us to do things that maybe we would never have achieved. It was like a spark in the dark that told us that we had to insist and maybe that funding has a rather a strategic value more than uh, financial. And this is uh, uh, for each project the investments over the last uh, two years, three years actually. The company invested four 0.1 million euros uh, for the side ship of molecular biology, infrared spectrometry with the Antibiotica project, and digital holography is another uh, part of the Antibiotica uh, project. And then we also focused on uh, spin-offs of this project uh, when the pandemic broke out. This type of investment uh, was mirrored by the increase in the number of uh, employees. So you see for each type of project, the new hirings, uh, 24 new hirings in research and development, 18 researchers, three software engineers, and two uh, other employees in general services. As for the first uh, project, Antibiotica, this is a project that was carried out uh, at the beginning with Elettra. Mrs. Vaccari mentioned it before. It is a project where Elettra helped us develop applications for, for infrared spectrometry to find a new way to identify bacteria in clinical uh, in a clinical setting they started uh, uh, certain activities in in an area that for us was completely new because we didn't know anything about spectrometry thanks to them we were able to set up the first databases and the four chemometrical um, data and then we were able to rely on employees of Elettra and with them we set up an internal research and development uh, uh, department. They are former Elettra employees and former CNR employees and we have developed this unit 
which meets the needs uh, of our project. The other soul of the Antibiotica project uh, sees a collaboration with uh, CNR, the National Research Center, with uh, Professor Dan Koyok. This is a, an advanced technology for digital holography. It is an optic technique that allows us to see the particles in 3D. It's an evolution of uh, cytofluorimetry, basically. And uh, in this project for us, well, we have developed the whole of the hardware, the whole of the technology. Now we would have to implement uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence systems to try and automize uh, the various reading phases of this technology, which has a very strong potential. The second uh, uh, most important uh, uh, research project is the Zeit chip. The Zeit chip is a project carried out together with ICGB. Uh, Professor Marcello is in charge of virology. Initially, we used uh, these uh, thermo thermocycler molecular mouse. Uh, it's just as big as a computer chip. It is a smaller platform for uh, molecular biology available on the market. We developed it together with S. MST microelectronics and on this platform and this was before uh, the pandemic we wanted to perform tests for flavivirus, Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya typical tropical diseases by exploiting the know-how of ICGB as an institution so on this chip, we placed all of the chemistry for uh, the detection of viral RNA so that in, in a very small period of time and with miniaturized system, we could identify uh, RNA having to do with uh, viral diseases. Now, this project was almost concluded, but then the pandemic broke out, and then given that the foundations were there, we developed it for COVID-19. So since February 2020, we have started working on this device for COVID-19, and in October 2020, we were ready on the market because we already had the foundations ready. We work together with ICGB and other national research centers. This product is selling very well. Uh, we're very happy with it. And uh, it is associated with other products that Halifax uh, is distributing, uh, but they come from different manufacturers outside our own group. This is the test panel on the molecular mouse platform. On the one side, we have viral uh, diseases, and on the other, we have bacterial diseases, especially uh, sepsis. And we are planning to market a very important uh, uh, mouse, and we expect it to be uh, internationally leader of this project. And in a patient with sepsi, these uh, molecular mouse will be able to identify the pathogen and possible resistant mechanisms. And we're talking about diseases whose mortality increases uh, by 7 8% every hour uh, there is a delay in the diagnosis. This is therefore a, a, a fundamental device. Uh, um, of course, uh, many of these patients, when it comes to antibiotic uh, resistance, given that there were patients that could not go to the hospital during the lockdown period, uh, last year we saw an increase in antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistance. This is uh, our research unit that was completed in Basovica a few months ago. Next to the R&D section, we have the manufacturing uh, area where we produce these molecular mouse mice. 
1.4 million euro that was our initial investment we have labs uh, covering an area of 400 square meters for molecular bio biology uh, protein science and uh, that was something that was added during the summer and to conclude i'd like to end uh, on protein science. Protein science is the new rival in the field of innovation. Last year, we bought both the labs and the research labs of Rota Farm that was settled in Area Science Park in Basovica. That company had an R&D unit. That R&D unit has the know-how for the development of monoclonal antibodies and recombinant antigens. Rotafarm used it to develop monoclonal antibodies to treat neurodegenerative diseases. The idea now is to convert uh, that know-how to produce to manufacture diagnostic tools, uh, in particular in the immunology uh, domain. From there, we started developing products uh, to fight COVID-19. We developed a saliva uh, harvesting system and the uh, dips uh, sticker for a rapid saliva harvest that can be used uh, maybe not in hospitals but uh, by ordinary citizens we might use it in schools or uh, uh, within our communities where testing has to be performed however we need this test to be easy and as wide as possible, we've also developed a, a swab, a second generation swab, and, and the performance is indeed uh, extraordinary. And last but not least, we are developing a new uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, test for COVID-19, because now, I mean, most of the population is vaccinated. To be able to assess the validity and the effic effectiveness of vaccines, it is important to see whether the patient has not just the presence of antibodies, but of a subclass of antibodies that are anti-spike one of the RBD region. And these are the antibodies that can intercept the interaction between a virus and ACE2 receptors. So it's a very specific test to assess uh, the uh, antibodies of the patient uh, versus the COVID-19 uh, disease. We are developing it uh, as a lateral flow rapid test technology. It could be used uh, uh, in, within our communities in, and we believe that monitoring uh, the spread of the virus in the post-vaccine era uh, is of great relevance and this should help us in the long-term managing management of our citizens and of our workers. This is how this uh, AC2 access door test will work that will be marketed by the end of the year. We really bank on it. We believe uh, in, in this test. Uh, I thank you for your attention and I really wish you a fruitful day. And thank you once again, Diego, for, uh, for this event. Thank you. Thank you. I wish to thank Giampiero, really. We've known each other uh, for quite a long time. We've been working together in the fields of training for research purposes. Now I'd like to give the floor to Fabio Firmani from the BioValley Group. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to talk to you about Chemomaker, an example of how we went from research to the market 
for an innovative system for the um, delivery of uh, patient-specific chemotherapy drugs. I deal with the oper operational side of things. I'm going to give you an introduction to this device, but behind there has been a lot of work from BioValley to develop this device. Now we're going to look at how it works. Let's go to the classical data flow for chemotherapy. We have, we measure the dose, the oncologist prescribes the drugs, the pharmacist prepares the drugs, there's manual dosage, and then the dosage is then delivered to the patient. What are the associated risks with this scenario? Of course, in the uh, hospital pharmacy there, we have concentrated drugs, which are highly toxic, uh, manual dosing, as it's a loaded risks, because you get exposed to ele toxic elements, while when it comes to the hospital and the patient, the error, the danger of swapping, the automatization of the process to prepare the chemo drugs are a necessary evolution. The project was set up within Nadia Tools, which saw a host of institutions working together. We have private companies, pro public hospitals, research entities, which created this project. BioValley then developed the Chemo Maker, and we shall now see how the system changes from before. The project has three elements, a sensor, a bio-nano sensor, which sees the concentration of the drug for each patient, a data exchange platform, which is not only a hospital system, we talked about it before. It could be a, an issue for tele, telemedicine. So that's why in the Recovery and Resilience Fund, we have a special section on that. And the automatic preparing device. We studied what were the connected risks with the manual preparation and what we had available for first-generation robot preparation. These were the details of the project. A unit which can be fitted on a table, very accurate in dosage, faster than the competition we have on the market, to make sure that drugs are transferred through sterile cartridges and hence the risk of contamination is minimized. Accuracy, which is done through real-time measuring of the dosage while the dosage is being done, and everything that comes in or outside, goes out of the system is doubly checked with a um, barcode and RFID system. Hence, mistakes are reduced through these devices. Lastly, we have the connectivity, the ability to create systems through hospital prescription systems and remote ma um, maintenance and a competitive cost that comes not only from uh, re reducing the size of the system, but since the system is in a hood, it makes quite a difference to the pharma sector. This is how we started with a project. In 2017-2019, we had the R&D stage, where we in the uh, high COVID period, we took advantage and to go to the industry and to increase the profile of the machine. And so we went to the go-to-market stage with a version that is even better 
by increasing the capabilities of the drugs and vials that can be used up until 100 ml and using multi dosages in order to create various dosages with the same active principle without changing the containers. So we um, have managed to get to almost a liter for the drugs that are then taken to the patients. Briefly, safety, we said that the drug is dosed in the final container, traceability, everything that comes in, comes out, is checked and measured through a barcode system and radio frequency one, sterile environment, which is based on uh, single-use cartridges and accuracy because one cell can measure the dosage while this happens, where the dosage happens. We said that it's a compact device. You see that if we look at the sizes and you think about the first generation of robots uh, take up four cubic meters and require the treatment plants, and of, uh, cooling systems, you will see that from the practicality and cost um, point of view, we can insert a, 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 in a pharmacy this system for manual dosages. The device has a board, a chemo plan, that not only manages the software and the work cycle of the machine, it creates the labels and interconnects the various signals. It also manages a database of drugs in the pharmacy, but also the residue. Because when we have the manual dosage, the partially used vials are not completely used, whereas through the system, a trace is being kept of the residual drug in the partially used containers and when subsequent preparations are necessary it suggests to use uh, the remaining substances and last but not least this is the interface with a dialogue system with HL7 protocol to put the chemo maker with the chemo plan in the hospital system. You saw beforehand what was the input of the project. What we gathered, collected at the end of the project, we collected all the objectives of the project. Accuracy is under what is required from the pharma sector for this type of operation, we can get to up to 30 doses per hour. And being able to do all of this safely for the operators and the patients with a cost to efficiency ratio, which is quite high. In this table, I wanted to sum up what is the go to market side. We indicated the targets that we are aiming for. But due to time issues, we have prepared contracts, distribution lines, sort of a toolkit, as I would say, of all the tools that we need in order to go to market. With a very clear roadmap from now onwards. Conclusions. The cooperation between such as public finances mechanism, R&D and industrial development and the market, each of these stakeholders, each in its own sector, allowed us to complete this project. with the fact that 
the private company has all the tools to put into practice the R&D efforts. At 2 o'clock in room B, we're going to have our colleague, Mr. Cicognane, who is going to present the uh, device live and he will show you that all the sequences that have been placed here as a workflow will be shown to you to see the flow, the speed of the device in carrying out the operations. Thank you. Thank you. I would give the floor now to Mr. Paulus from Eurospital. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your invitation, and thank you, Diego, for this uh, wonderful invitation that sees us for the first time in this headquarters. I hope it's going to be the beginning of a wonderful and long cooperation. I would like to tell you about how a company from this area, Eurospital, which produces and sells pharmaceutical products and, and medical devices here uh, in Trieste, has been working for the past 70 years in this uh, area, has gone through various phases, and especially in the last one year and a half, knew how to modify the main Mm -hmm. the, its main points of reference, especially in its recent history, it identified what were the unsaid needs in the public service. So we started almost 40 years ago talking about celiacs when nobody knew what they were, and from there we evolved in this market. We have grown, we've become the owners of the patent, which is a marker for the Celiex, and it's Italian, and it's from Trieste. It's something that we need to repeat. This was then taken to um, different other markers, a new one that we have been selling for 20 years, but it has been successful in the past five. It, we try to advertise it uh, thanks to opinion leaders and involving all um, kind of stakeholders. And the last one is the one that allowed us to be at the vanguard. This is what happened with COVID. As my colleague said, before my, my uh, Gian Piero Spezzotti were, we were overcome by COVID. It wasn't enough to be a diagnosis uh, company to have good results and um, products at the vanguard. It was fundamental to act quickly. This is the image of the pre-pandemic situation. We have been present in Italy and outside of with a turnover of 50 50, 10 million uh, turnover, which is divided equally. The, our, our sector is industrial enterology and molecular biology, and this is quite a reduced um, sector. We talk, we produce and develop internally some of our best products. In March, the pandemic started, but I always want to remember that on the 28th of January, called us and said, guys, move, that something is brewing. Help us because we need it. From there, we tried to find some solutions, but what happened is that there was a sharp, slow down from what we see, these classical sale lines. And this was a problem because we 
we had a reduction of products in stock and a revision of the production plan. While well, production just arrived at a standstill. Abroad, the situation was quite similar one month later, but with the same markers. The pandemic was more or less difficult in the various countries, and we had a loss of 40% of the sales. Our strength is that we managed to come to the front very quickly. We had immediate reactions in order to support and diagnose this. As, as we were already, or be it limitedly, in, in, in microbiology, we tried to recreate that network with microbiologists that knew each other. And we managed to conclude some deals with companies that we knew and we already had in our portfolio. And so new opportunities, enormous ones in molecular biology, when we started working on tests and swabs, and which were important for the present and the future. These are the tests that we have extraction kits, quick tests, antigenic tests, third, fourth, fourth generation, ELISA tests for neutralizing uh, infections, and we have just uh, introduced, but not inserted here, the test to measure of the memory cells for the vaccine. So there has been a constant adaptation of the COVID conditions, which allows us to have um, the unexpected results, because all of these uh, products had to be validated internally and with our network of opinion leaders. In the international markets, we had the same situation. Further, um, rendered more difficult because we had international events that were lacking, no conferences, no medical events, and it was difficult contacting our international markets. We revised our strategies, we restructured our plans, and we started working on the technological activities that we weren't used to, and they have become part of our daily lives in less than a year. Than a year. Another opportunity that COVID gave us, since the production was blocked because sales were very limited, we needed to reorganize our internal resources. Uh, we have highly qualified personnel or PhD. We have decided to outsource them and getting uh, to work on the, the IVDR regulations which in, di in the diagnosis sector will arrive in March 2022. That means that in the past eight months allowed us to be, to be approved in the audit process. In January, we're going to be one of the first companies in the store, in the sector, um, to sell products according to the IVDR regulations. Those who will not comply will be out of the market. So it was also another opportunity, and it gave us an international press outlook. It allowed us to increase our range of products and what we provided. We extended our market share in molecular biology, and we introduced new distribution lines while setting up internal test systems. It was done by associating products and systems in full automation. So we needed to organize from the point of view of RNS, um, marketing, technical and non-technical stuff in the automation part. What we want to expect for the post-COVID period, you see here, various proposals for proposals for automation in order to arrive 
the EU can star platform that have, we started to sell from the start from the end of last year. Thanks to COVID, this project was boosted and we closed in six months. It is a project that needs all 18 months to arrive to this device. This device can extract automatically with you know, Eurospectral products, analyze data, and it's all connected with a lab IT system with our EasyNAT system, which was also developed by us. This device is a response to the need of screening in hospitals that need to handle 1,000 samples per day before the lockdown. Um, more than uh, one lab was necessary to do the screening. It has given us an enormous possibility to have a boost and not limited to COVID, but let it have it a life of its own after COVID. This is our current market share. In a few months, we arrived at this turnover diversification, diversification covering 80%, I'm sorry, 20% Italy, 80% internationally. And as segment in molecular biology, we are reaching 70% of our turnover. At, at the moment, we are at a stage where the classical business has been relaunched. We are back to the pre-COVID, pre-pandemic levels. The COVID business is still higher than our expectations. The um, evaluations differed from one week to, the, to another because it and we were way under what we expected. We didn't expect to arrive in autumn with these figures. And the um, biology, molecular biology business was opened and, and allows us to get closer to this technique and all labs can do it too. There are various platforms in the area. Our national presence has increased and thus we managed to implement new tests that we create in-house but also outside our company. And for a few months now we have um, so started selling our machine for various diseases that are grouped um, in groups of tests, sexually transmitted diseases, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, tropical fever, and immunodepressed, immunocompromised or um, thrombotic mutations. This allows us to offer our clients a wide range of products, offering items both for labs and human genetics associated with other products that we had in our portfolio. This is basically, this is what we expect from the future, uh, from a point of view of diversification of turnover, because we're going to have a higher degree of, um, uh, higher weight in the Italian market. We have a 40 percent segment for molecular biology, which we didn't have um, as big as uh, is in the past, and we're going to increase it even more in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Ferraro. Of the Swiss, Dr. Carrara, I apologize, from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. Dr. Carrara. Mr. Carrara. Here I am. I was only quarreling with Zoom. <laughs> I was fighting with Zoom because Zoom was asking me whether I wanted a video to be shown. I actually, I want to share my video and I have a presentation here. So sorry. Sorry for this fight that I had with Zoom. I'm going to share my screen with you. 
and I hope you're seeing my presentation. So good morning once again. I thank the organizer and uh, the chairman of this session. I, I am not from Trieste, possibly the only one, if I'm not wrong. I'm a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale of Lausanne. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you this morning. I was asked to share with you what we've been doing over the last uh, 15 years in the field of uh, sensors uh, for biomedical applications, usually diagnostics. In the uh, last presentation of the previous session, well, I'm, I belong with the academia and I like science fiction. Now, I'll try and confine myself to the 10 minutes I've been allotted, but I'll try and talk about things that um, possibly will not become a reality in the short term, but maybe over the next 10 years they will become true. So I'll start with what is feasible right now, uh, with shorter time to market times. Uh, as you know, when we talk about point of care, medicine, or personal electronics that are already on the market, many products available. This is the IBG Star product with uh, a sensor for glucose. The, it is a plug-in electronics to be connected to our smartphone to measure glycemia. This is the latest glucometer by Abbott. It's an electrochemical sensor with an electronic front end, and we measure glucose once again. Uh, now, the sector of wearable devices is uh, growing. We expect uh, $70 billion as a market size in the near future. And the idea is that of connecting all our patients online so as to be able to monitor them constantly. Along the way, I believe that over and above glucose that's already existing on the market, we have to be careful to be selective. Because these sensors uh, exploit the characteristics of biomolecules uh, to assure for specificity. We have full integration of nanostructure to assure sensitivity, and then we need the right electronics uh, for her in order to have automatic systems. In this slide, we have to um, highlight the three keywords, bio, nano, and CMOS, because these are the keywords that do require co-design. To be clear, we can't have an electronic system and then find, uh, look for bio applications. Everything has to be designed together. I published a book on uh, this co-design. For those of you who are interested, there are three chapters uh, on uh, specific interactions or be among micromolecules. Uh, uh, over and above glucose, as I was saying, we were talking this morning about tumor markers, uh, probe molecules. We have to reduce non-specific signals that we inevitably have. We have to increase specific signals to develop the electronics that we need. Very rapidly, some examples of these three keywords before showing you the application. If you want to transfer specificity, not just for glucose, but for many human metabolites like lactate, cholesterol, ATP, and so on and so forth, and obviously drugs, drugs as well. Because, for instance, in chemotherapy, we need drugs to be involved, and even ions. We need probe molecules to be selective for this target. I'm only making an example uh, with oxidase. Oxidase is used for glucose, but could be used uh, for many other metabolites like lactate, cholesterol, or glutamate. Oxidate interacts uh, with the substrate, and it produces hydrogen peroxide, which is electrochemically active, and it produces ions, and we can therefore measure electricity. The problem is that these things are being done, 
but they have to be suited for the application. An example. We can measure a drug, Vrapamil, by exploiting another enzyme belonging to another class, which is uh, uh, the isoform 3A4. We, the problem is measuring that in the blood of our patients, and there we find out well, the sensitivity has to be much higher, below 0.3 nanomolar. So this sensor can certainly not be used because it will be blind, it will be deaf to uh, these small concentrations uh, in the patient's blood. But with nanotechnologies, we can improve the sensitivity of our sensors. This is another example. It is uh, an antiblastic uh, product, cyclophosphamide, always using the 3A4 enzyme. If we measure it on the natural electrodes, uh, we are still outside the therapeutic range uh, found in the blood of our patients, but if we add carbon nanotubes, uh, the multi-wall carbon nanotube, we can achieve the required uh, sensitivity. We've been working not just with nanotube, but with nanoparticles. It's a method to produce nanoparticles, uh, starting from platinum uh, uh, salts. This is a picture. Uh, an electronic microscope uh, um, image uh, of these spheres and petals. And one of the things that we did is to produce these nanospheres and nanopetals on a CMOS device. So I have to have a very miniaturized device uh, availing itself of this nanotechnology to be able to uh, measure concentrations in the blood of our patients. There will be a lot to be said but there's not much, time, not much time available. I'm only telling you that over the last 10 years, we were able to develop certain chips, the last one with the Imperial College uh, uh, in London. You saw the nanostructures on metal. Uh, we're still working uh, at its characterization, the whole of which serves to monitor human metabolites remotely. But I haven't told you as yet about uh, implantable or wearable devices. Very rapidly, we've devised uh, various implantable, wearable, or portable devices. Very rapidly, I'm showing you some applications. This is for intensive care units. We did it with Angelo Menarini Diagnostics, an Italian company. We have produced this box, uh, a few uh, tens of cubic centimeters with seven sensors to measure biochemical uh, uh, parameters, glucose, potassium, uh, lactate, uh, in critical patients in intensive care units. Here you have uh, uh, you can uh, use uh, drainage fluids here on the sensors. Uh, the drainage fluids are get in touch with the sensors and then the measurement takes place. This is something we devised with the hospital in Lausanne, which is the university hospital in Lausanne. Here we were measuring three uh, uh, drugs, uh, paracetamol and others. For... Uh, anesthesia, for the injection of anesthetic drugs. This is uh, implantable. This is a platform with flexible electronic to be worn, and this for sports applications. This is one of our PhD students wearing this device, and the measurement of sodium and potassium that we were able to measure in real time. With the same PhD student, a few years later, we have manufactured this prototype to measure to measure propofol. Propofol is a very dangerous uh, drug used in anesthesiology. And this is a handheld uh, device uh, that exploits deep learning for the measurement of propofol. Now, the major challenge is that of using uh, subcutaneous devices. They have to be very, very thin. 
This is a couple of prototypes. This is one square centimeter, six sensors, four electrochemical sensors, as one pH and one temperature sensors. And here there's another prototype, very small indeed. We have three chips on this device, and uh, the size is uh, um, surgery needle. Syringe injectable electronics uh, is already a reality on the market. Medtronic is already implanting devices with this approach. This is an electrocardiograph, uh, uh, which is subcutaneously injected in the patient. Uh, we've talked about portable, implantable, and wearable. What else uh, would uh, George Klunig say? Well, together with a friend in London, we have invented this body dust. In other words, you can drink diagnostic devices that are then dispersed all through our body. We are not the only one in the world. The Gartner Group already in 2018 said that smart dust is just uh, the beginning of climbing this curve. Uh, we have imagined to develop or to investigate, to scientifically study some science fiction, as the colleague was saying before, while closing the previous session. Drinking a fluid containing diagnostic chips then then get dispersed all through our body, through the vascular system of the patient. Now, we have to have very small sizes, uh, smaller than uh, blood cells, below 30 micron, and these devices have to be biocompatible. But over and above biocompatibility, which is important, but relatively easy to overcome, the major challenge is to have very small sensors with the necessary electronics, with the uh, small data link electronics, uh, with powering approaches and extremely power small power receivers, and we have to demonstrate the effectiveness in body, at least on animals. So the major challenge is having one cube of CMOS, a few tens of microns, with all necessary transistors that we need and on top of that, the necessary sensors. Due this year, I published a paper summarizing the latest uh, uh, advancement. Uh, the first uh, the topics have already been uh, demonstrated. We, have, uh, we are testing right now a chip for uh, uh, power reception. We are at 230 micron. But then uh, the in-body applications by drinking still has to be demonstrated. However, of course, we might say that time is right uh, when in 2014 I had a cover saying never online with this Superman with all on-board electronics necessary to make diagnostic examinations. As I've shown you, we're still uh, in a period of dedicated electronics, but there are many solutions that uh, we have been working with the biotech to ensure selectivity, with nanotech to ensure sensitivity and, con uh, and a limit of detection in the range of causation of human tissues. And for the time being, I think we have been able to demonstrate that portable electronics can be done, bioelectronics, portable, implantable, and wearable bioelectronics is feasible. I thank the whole of my group for uh, everything that we've been doing, everything I've been talking about, and I include here, given that I had to stick to the 10 minutes at my disposal, if there are questions, uh, you can write me an email, and I'll be very happy to answer. And I wish to thank the chairman of this session. Thank you, Professor Carrara. Very interesting indeed, uh, very innovative. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Menegoni, my co-chairman. I hope you can hear me. I'll try and keep within the time I've been all allotted given that we have a slight delay vis-a-vis -vis our schedule. I'm going to talk to you about Bio Valley Group. Uh, Bio Valley Group, uh, 
as a family and friends office started by Diego Bravar. And we invest in the bio, bio high tech industrial field. And we do that within the ecosystem of Trieste uh, and our region and other regions of the Alpe Adria area. There are maybe places in Italy um, where Trieste is not known as a city of science. So I think it is important to highlight why it is of strategic importance to be in Trieste today. Because Trieste internationally, Trieste and Friuli Venezia Giulia, have been considered to be strong innovators. And over the years, in 2015 and 2020, the region has uh, uh, been banking on smart health, supporting various research projects, which turned out to be strategic because they were resilient versus the pandemic. Trieste, as Professor Rufo was saying, is rich with research organizations, both at national and international level. And thanks to these premises, over the last 30 years, we've been able to achieve the highest concentration of innovative startups in Italy. So the why of this region has to do with strategic uh, characteristics of Friuli Venezia Giulia. Bio Valley Group in this region has known three different phases. The first one from 2015 to 2017, when we mainly focused on incubation processes, acceleration, of local startups with uh, equity minority investments and by providing strategic and managerial support. A second stage from 2017 to 2020, so very close to the pandemic, and there we focused on uh, accelerating the growth of these company thanks to the BioVal investment partners that invest in majority investments in the most promising companies so as to allow for their growth. And then the third phase, which is the current one, where Bio Valley Group, and we've seen it with the project presented this morning, has been trying to further enhance the growth of the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Trieste. Thank you to uh, Trieste Valley. In other words, by introducing a new ingredient, in other words, digitalization. A couple of examples of what we have done during the pandemic, because as was said before, Marco Poles uh, highlighted it, the pandemic can be seen as a problem, but also as an opportunity, especially for the companies in this sector. During the pandemic, we accelerated the collaboration with the local research institutions, in particular with ICGB. With them, we tested and verified the effectiveness of a drug, a biological drug, Uh, it is a, a, a drug against uh, uh, COVID, and we've seen that in vitro, its effectiveness was uh, already considerable at acceptable concentration in the human body, which allowed us to patent uh, the uh, medication. And now we are about to validate the effectiveness in vivo of this drug. Another research field, and Professor Larese mentioned it this morning, and we indeed intensify our collaboration with local research institutions. Well, in this project, we work together with the local health agency, University of SNIGB. We analyzed uh, the effectiveness of tests that were recommended at the beginning of the pandemic. We wanted to study these tests and verify uh, the best of them together with ICGB. And then 
together with the health agency, Trieste, University of Trieste and ICGB, we uh, launched a clinical trial uh, on uh, COVID-19 affected patients. And, and this is a project for the future, we accelerated the activities of Trieste Valley. We have, uh, Trieste Valley has a high performance computer and during the pandemic, we not only provided HPC services to Area Science Park and in particular to a company working in the field of generative models developed through AI, but thanks to our network and thanks to collaboration, which is a bit the feel rouge in all our presentation, thanks to our collaboration with other companies, local companies like ServerNet uh, 03 and Plus, uh, we were able to win uh, the pre-commercial contract for an, uh, an hospital in Cagliari with a problem which was the diagnosis of uh, colorectal cancer through imaging and we were able to win that uh, contract each of these companies with its own experience and skills uh, and we uh, submitted to, to the Cagliari Hospital the innovative solution to improve the diagnosis and stage capacity of colorectal cancer. At the same time we were also able to set up a team, a team of different companies which together with CISA, ICGB and SIC in Freiburg are setting up a cross-border project for the early detection of COVID-19 outbreaks by big data analysis. And as we were saying, we are focusing on COVID-19 right now, but this big data analysis could be further enlarged or applied to other diseases with similar features. To conclude, what we're trying to do is to uh, act as catalyst uh, for the local startup system in Trieste and in the Alte Adria region because we have realized that there is a lot of research going on, there is much added value locally, there are startups but we have to combine different competencies, different companies so as to promote an industrial approach that can capitalize and build on all that research and competencies that sometimes are very much fragmented in very specialized sectors. We've heard a very specific terminology in today's presentation. So by doing so, we can capitalize the value of individual companies in our region. Thank you. We have the professor here. Can you hear me? Yes. I hope you can hear me. Still. I will try to sum up very quickly since we are very late. It wasn't our fault. We were quite on time, I think. From what I heard, it seems to me that on the one hand, companies are facing with problems connected to clinical trials and which require the use and collaboration with health institutions also for uh, certification and bearing in mind the regular rules that have just entered into force or will enter into force. On the other hand, there is a good collaboration with research institutions and a good integration of synergies between companies we had many um, projects which I define as winning projects. That is, research was exploited and brought to uh, results in the market. We heard, for example, how, for example, one's portfolio was increased 
or how new projects were being brought forward despite COVID or thanks to COVID in this case. We heard and understood what is the important of, importance of incubators and financing, both regional and private, which are needed to transform R&D into products for the market, for example, like we just heard now. And to conclude, we saw adaptation from the companies through this period, which was quite an unfortunate one from various point of views, but which was exploited widely in our region, which means that our companies are alive and well. They're lively. They can deal with extraordinary problems such as this one. I would end here my sum up. I don't know if you want to add something. I'm, would you like to add something? I'm a bit younger than Brava though, so. Just a couple of other words as an outlook. I don't know if you can see my slides or if not, I'm just going to improvise. Analysis have been carried out at, of the global situation. I see some slides coming up for the outlook. Okay. Dicevo, eh, organizzazioni internazionali hanno analizzato nel dettaglio. Various international organizations have analyzed what was the response at global level. And this is a very simple graph that goes on to analyzing the phases, the output of various phases. You can't see it. Oh, we can see it here in the Saba room. Okay, yes, we can see it, thank you. So there's a forward stage that we saw it because we saw some projects that bring research forward on various viruses or identifying various molecules. They found themselves ready when the crisis hit to go from absorbing to adapting very quickly, um, even reaching a transformation stage, as we saw with Eurospital. And this, over and above, because there have been research measures and reorganization of the team measures that allowed for the shock to be absorbed, This is from Google. We saw how 90% of physicians use telemedicine. If you want, a pandemic can be seen as an accelerator for change. And uh, it forced institutions to frog jump that briefly, uh, briefly, whereas other advancements would have taken years. Let me quote our regional government, uh, which organized the G20 on digital transformation. And in the document that was signed on the 5th of August, we uh, underlined the important role held by the innovation ecosystems that we are quite a fair representation today. And all of the presentations that you showed us, the collaboration between the private and public, is something that needs to be human-centered. It, it is meant to actually make a difference in the patient. For the future, uh, from 20. 20 to 2030, we have the decade for healthy aging, according to, to the UN. So what we saw about biosensors, drug analysis, or the future that was presented to us, 
by Sandro Carrara. So what could be the next, the near future can lead us this way. So if you want what we saw today and what the pandemic speeded up and the scenario for the following years will be a digital transformation. If it's true that we're going to have, we're going to need nanosensors which will be electronically calibrated and able to dial, uh, to have a dialogue, the digital will be master of it all. We are going from a waiting medicine, so I wait to see something outside of symptom that is easily detectable, towards initiative medicine, where I proactively use a sensor, I use a device in order to intervene as quickly as possible. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Many thanks. I would like to thank all the speakers. Again, thank you, Diego. I don't know if you are still here in the room for our final greeting. Thank you. Thank you. Diego, would you like to speak for last? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carrara. Thank you everyone from the bottom of my heart for the passion of these presentations.